Hello, everyone. Today is April 5th, 2012. I'm Dave Landry, and this is the week in charts. I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on Mountain Dew because we've got a lot to cover again this week. You're welcome, Willie. Willie's saying thanks for doing the webinar. I do them every uh, Thursday at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. Oh, good stuff. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement, but if anyone out there, or PepsiCo for that matter, has an equally caffeinated drink and would like to uh, sponsor the show, please give me a call. Red Bull thought I was too fat. There's a disclaimer screen. I could sum that up pretty quickly. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. If you read my book, you like my book, put a review up. I get emails all the time from people. Oh, I love your book. It's so great. Blah, blah, blah. Like, put a review on Amazon, please, please. All right. Let's get through uh, this housekeeping, which is a necessary evil, as quickly as possible. My first two books are available in ebook and only in ebook format and only directly from me. If you see them anywhere else, they're probably counterfeit. Uh, they're cheap, though, relatively cheap, I should say. If you want them both, shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, uh, I was in the show. You said uh, you'd make me a deal if I want them both, and, and I'll uh, be happy to do that for you. Uh, patterns are still relevant. In fact, we're going to look at one of the patterns from the first book today. The first two books were more manuals, more like trading manuals, more like cookbooks is one way of uh, explaining it with the third book and I often call it my last book because uh, who knows I mean I might write one someday but for now I can't imagine ever writing another book this is pretty much everything I know about trading I put into this book I can't imagine there's a few things that come up in these webinars but other than that this is it guys so um, everything's in there and then especially when you can find the first two book that's all my patterns and everything tip jar I have a uh, button on my website if you get some of these webinars uh, feel free to put something in the tip jar. If you want to see the recordings, you can also pick up those off my website. TC Club, I think everybody knows here. And I'm a big fan of TC for my U.S. work. I use Metastock for my international work, and I do have some formulas for it. So if you have um, Metastock, let me know. If you do have TC, I'll give you all my formulas and scans and everything for that, too. Everything I do is very open, I think, as most of you know. There's no G whiz and this and that. I mean, you know... I guess if I uh, if I were a different type of person, I could make it a lot more gee whiz. It probably could actually make money off the educational side of the business. But uh, I really just have fun, or a lot of fun, I should say, doing the, uh, the um, educational side of the business. Uh, what else? I think everybody knows I'm a bit of a ham. Uh, I have a trading service. There's some information on that. And in a trading package, basically – all of the above. I'll tell you. Look at some archives. Um, I'll give you some uh, pointers. Uh, what else? Especially if you tell me like your current or prior career, I'll give you a few things that'll help you out. And there's a few things you need to know if you've been, if you're in a current or prior career, or have been in a prior career, I should say, where um, you're a highly trained individual, such as a doctor, a lawyer, or even an automatic transmission mechanic. You know, the bad news is it's going to take you a little bit longer to become a trader because you're probably too smart. Your prior or current career was, produ was a approach, not produce, approach with a high degree of logic and a trading often is none. And I think the other thing is you're a couple things, too. Uh, one, you forget how long it took you to become proficient in that career. And then the last thing, or one of the things, I should say, is that you're going to be wrong a lot. But if half your bridges of patience uh, fell down, uh, fell down, I guess if you're a doctor, it's okay if your patients fall down before they come to you. Uh, but if half your bridges fell down or half your patients died or half your transmissions failed, you wouldn't be in business long. This is the wrong date. I uh, didn't update that. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's get to the show. I hate all that housekeeping, but, again, it's a necessary evil. Uh, you know, once again, it's still all good, y'all, and I put the word mostly in here last week, and uh, we'll leave it in there, but I still think the market's in pretty good shape. We're going to get to that in a little while. Um, today, like last week, what I'd like to do, again, is cover one or two things and then turn the show over to you. So while I'm covering these things, if there's something that you want uh, me to talk about while I'm on the slides before we hop into the markets and before we look at the individual stocks, 
just feel free to bring up the subject. And I've been doing this kind of random thoughts thing for a while. And, you know, when I did the shows, usually when I do a show, I'll go in the house, and my wife is like, uh, how'd it go? I was like, well, I rambled a lot, but I feel like I may have brought it all back together. And then uh, one day, somebody actually told me, you know, it's the rambling when I learn something. So uh, you guys do a pretty good job of drawing me out on subjects, and I go off on some tangents, but usually I'm able to pull it back together. So we're going to keep that random thoughts theme going after I cover a couple of little concepts here. So if there's something you want to know about money management, position management, trading in general, or anything like that, feel free to ask now, and I'll try to get to it best I can while we're in the slides. Um, what I also like to do is I like to use my emails and current market conditions to kind of give me an idea of what needs to be covered out there. And I got an email on trading around core positions. So let me just go over this real quick. I know we've covered it before, but uh, just so you know what's going on, let's say you're swing trading and you take, um, well, we could just use this chart here, I guess. Let's say you enter here, and to keep the math easy, we're just going to do 200 shares, okay? Now, in reality, this number would be based on your account size, based on the percentage of um, your portfolio if stopped out, but that's a money management lesson. So let's just assume for educational purposes here that we're going to buy 200 shares of stock, and then let's say if it rallies up a little bit, we're going to go ahead and take off 100 shares, okay? So now we only have 100 shares left, but let's say the stock sets up again. We're going to put back on 100 of those shares. So now we're up to 200, and then we're going to flip out 100 shares. And then we're going to hopefully rinse and repeat and do that quite a few times, okay? Now let's look at a real-world example. Hi, Dave. I enjoy your weekly webinar and your service. I'd like to get your opinion on Hymix. So I'd like to re-enter Hymix. I took a half profit of 185. I'd like to get back in around 215 and look to take profits at 40 over and a stop 40 under. What do you think? And I came back with, I like the way you think, Ken. So let's take a look at that. So we got in Hymix back here. And it rallied up, and those might remember some previous shows. It came with it like one cent of the profit target. I was uh, pleading and preaching to everyone to take profits, partial profits here, okay? And it didn't quite work out. At least it came back in, and then it rallied up again. And then we did officially hit that profit target on this day here. So let's, uh, let's just use 200 and 100, okay? And I guess a stock like this would be 2,000, 1,000. Let's just say... Let's say you bought 200 shares here, okay? And let's just make it easy. Let's say you flipped out 100 here, okay? And then now it sets up again. And let's see. This is this is the wrong chart. Talk amongst yourselves. Let me see if I can fix this. Hmm. Well, we might just have to use a real chart. Let's see. Give me one second here. Let's see if I can fix it real quick. It should just take a second. See if I can do this on the fly. If I can, I'm going to be very impressed with myself. I'm sorry about that. Now would be a good time to come up with some good questions. Yeah, I probably won't be able to do this. Let's see. Ah, maybe so. Never say never, huh? Graphics. Date modified. Nope. Um, I, I lost it. Okay. All right. Let's just use a real chart then. Let's take a look at the actual chart here, and I'll show you what happened. So he was saying, get back in at 2.15, and so his profit target would be 40 cents above that. Now, so in this particular case, you got it back here, rallied up. You took partial profits here, okay? And then it rallies up again, and then pulls back, sets up as a pullback. And he was looking to get back in at 215 and 40 over 40 under. Now, here's the thing. Uh, obviously, that triggered today. But what I want to throw out at you is two things. One, obviously, the uh, main point is trading around positions like this, adding on, taking off, adding on, taking off. And the second thing is when you get a little quick windfall, like this, let's say you did come in today 
and you did do that add-on trade, okay? And there was plenty of trading around the open, uh, right around that 215, so it was possible to get in, okay? And let's say you immediately get this pop higher. There's nothing wrong with flipping that right out because sometimes it's hard for that to be sustainable. Now, I'm not saying be come a day trade or anything like that. And if you did get in, you did flip it right back out, no problem. Just sit tight on that remaining remaining shares, and then maybe you get another leg out and then rinse and repeat. Now, when I'm tracking this, last night in the service, I mentioned that this stock was set up. Last couple of days, I mentioned that it was set up again, and you might want to take a look at it. When I track the results of the service, though, I only track the original position, the actual profit target, not a near miss, and which if you track near misses, your performance would probably be a little better because discretion makes a big difference. Read the articles or discretion on my website. But I don't track a me re-recommending it as a uh, add-on trade because it just gets too too messy though. But I will personally go back in and do an add-on, and I think you can too. And this is how you beat the system. Um, everybody likes to pick apart, oh, Dave, your money management has a negative expectancy. Well, it has a negative expectancy if, A, you don't, you only get the initial profit target out of the position, and B, if, let me get this up here, see if I can get it to show you. Okay, let me just start over on that. Okay. It has a negative expectancy because people are saying that your risk here is one and your gains here are one. So that's one for one, one for one, okay? So you're risking one and you're only making one and people are like, that's got a negative expectancy. That'll never work. Well, it will work as long as you capture a few longer term gains like this to where this is some big multiple of one, let's say 10 times to one, okay? then it works, okay? And every trade I get in, I'm looking at some distant place way up here where I could at least make 5 to 10 to 20 times my initial investment, okay? I am involved in an institutional project, and they ask me for, they're always obsessed with this. Everybody's obsessed with how many to one, okay? Well, I always say it's one to one in the first loaf, but the second loaf is going to be at least six to one, and that's a pretty good number. And it's interesting. I just uh, originally I almost pulled this number out the air, but I started looking at quite a few charts, and it seems like any trade that I'm looking at always has a possible six to one potential. Um, but the reality is, you can't quantify all this. Everybody wants to quantify it, and you can't quantify it. And every time, you know, I've said this for the past several weeks, and I've said it quite a bit in the past too. If you had a way to quantify exactly a market edge, and that edge would work from now into eternity or even now for the next five or ten years, you would print money, and not only that, you would end up owning the world because take a look at like the casinos or business like that. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry, and a lot of what they do is just based on a very, very, very small edge. The problem with markets is markets change. Um, you do need to use your brain. You do need to use some discretion. You can't quantify all these things. But if you're coming in and using a discretionary technique like I just showed you where you're taking profits on near missings, misses while you're beating that system, you're also, if you also are adding on and flipping out, you're once again beating that system. So it's impossible to quantify all this, but that's a good thing. If you have a brain in your head, and we could argue that some people don't, okay? But if you have a brain in your head, you might as well use it and use a little common sense when it comes to the markets. And don't worry about quantifying all this because it's impossible to do, okay? So this is how you beat the system. You take that initial profit target and you're willing to ride it out for a longer term, hopefully longer term gains, okay? Now, any other questions on how to do that? The only other thing I wanted to point out is sometimes if you get lucky on a day like today and you get in and this thing just has a huge spike up, and that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier, it's okay to go ahead and just flip them out right away. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth, okay? But ideally, though, 
you want to stick with that second loaf and hopefully have it run up another uh, 100, 200, 300, 400 percent. Doesn't always happen. Obviously, if it did, we just sit on our boats, right? Or everybody would be doing it, right? And it wouldn't be a market. Okay. Now, I just kind of threw a lot out at you in a rambled kind of uh, jacked up on Mountain Dew fashion. Any questions on any of that before we uh, start hopping into the markets or any questions or trading in general? And I'll be happy to uh, look at those things. Okay. All right, Hobie, or is it Hobie or Hobby? If your stop is two points, is your partial profit at two points higher than the entry? Yes. Okay. Question is, let's say your stop is two points away from, oopsies, Hobie. Okay. Gotcha. All right, let's say your entry is there and your stop is here. And let's say that's two points. Well, your profit target, your initial profit target, this is why I always say, I stress the word initial profit target, because we're just looking to get one little loaf out, right? It's going to be two points higher. So from there to there is going to be two points. So from here to here, two points. Entry to the stop, and there to there, two points. That's going to be a one-to-one -one again, okay? And if all it ever happened was it rallies up, you get stopped out. It rallies up, you get stopped out. It rallies up, you get stopped out. Does it quite rally up? You get stopped out, or you just get stopped out. If all that ever happened was that, it would have a negative expectancy. A negative expectancy means over the long run, it will not make money. But if you're willing to use a little discretion and take some near-miss situations, if you're willing to use a little discretion and maybe add on and take off, add on and take off, so we trade around that core position, you're going to do quite well, and you're really going to beat the system drastically. It's going to make a huge difference. What's the difference between a swing trade and a momentum trade? Well, it's just time, okay? It's, there's nothing fancy about that. Uh, it's all momentum trading. Now, some people might some people might take a swing trade by, and I know some crazy, crazy-ass people, you know, like the market goes straight down. It gets extremely oversold. They might actually buy the market down here with the hopes that it reverts back to the bead and they flip it out a couple days later. That's fine and dandy, provided it doesn't do this, okay? And they tell you, don't use stops. Well, shoot, man, what are you going to do? You can let a, all the positions go to zero? So a swing trade is just a short-term trade. I am a momentum-based swing to intermediate-term trader. You could only predict the short term. Reread Layman's where I talked about predicting the weather and how it's akin to predicting the markets, right? You can predict the short term with a fair degree of accuracy in the markets. If you have an oversold market, there's a pretty good chance, provided it's in a very strong trend. Notice I have trend here. Notice we have trending markets up here, right? Okay. Strong trend. If you have a market that's uh, fairly oversold, there's a pretty good chance it's going to have a reversion to the bean move back in the direction of the trend. But we don't know if it's going to be trending next week, next year, or 10 years from now. So that's why we're sort of short-term traders. That's why I'm slotted as a swing trader, right? But in reality, I'll stay with position as long as it moves in our favor. We looked at an example not that long ago that we were in for over two and a half years. So what you'll see me do in these presentations is as long as positions are open and as long as they keep giving us good examples, I'll continue to show them in these presentations. So hopefully, let's mark this down. Write this down. What's today? April 5th, 2012. We are long Hymex. So hopefully April 5th. 2014, somebody will come in here and say, hey, Dave, remember that Hymax? And I was like, yeah, we're still in that bad boy, and it's at $100 a share. How about that? So I'm a momentum-based swing trader. You could be any kind of swing trader you want. You, you know, some people go out there and trade noise. You know, God bless you, point a little head. But, uh, yeah, swing trade is just the – it's almost – it's uh, exemplified perfect here in this textbook example. Ideally, let's see. One, two, three, four. Within three or four days, you get that initial profit target. Doesn't always happen. We've got one that's been open for a few weeks in here. Everybody's getting impatient. They're probably going to bail out. And then, of course, it's going to take off without them as soon as it does. Okay. Hope you like the sailboat. Yeah. I used to be a, an avid sailboat racer. Not on catamarans, though. I was a monohull kind of guy. 
ocean racing. Okay, I sometimes can't tell much difference between stocks and the watch list and those setups. Please discuss. Okay. Okay, um, there's a few things you can do. And, you know, I've, I've said this a thousand times. But when I, I haven't spoken in the States and, and, you know, other than like little webinars uh, in a long, long time. But if I did, if I were to speak, I would, I would devote an entire day to stock selection. And if you watch these webinars, you'll see, let me just see if we could get a, um, we could maybe use this Hymix as a pretty good example. Uh, you, there's a lot of things you could look for. Go in and read layman's and look at all the things I talked about with like trend, and I mentioned this in my prior books too, but with trend, um, the trade qualifiers. You want to look for wide range bars. You want to look for higher highs and higher lows. You want to look for, uh, is it accelerating higher? There's a lot of things you want to look for when you're looking at those trends, okay? So in this particular case, notice that it was a persistent move higher, meaning that it went up day after day after day after day after day. Also notice that this from here to here was a very impressive move percentage-wise, okay? And then you had a fairly deep pullback. Also notice that the stock trades fairly cleanly. It tends to just go up and correct. You know, now this is a great example because you don't have a longer term history in this particular case. But you can see that in general, it, trend, it tends to trend, it tends to base, it tends to trend. If a stock looks like an electrocardiogram, that's probably the biggest. Um, that's probably the biggest thing I could, um, the biggest lesson I could probably give you on stock selection, okay? If it looks like an electrocardiogram, then it probably, it's probably not a stock you should be trading, okay? Now let's see what's going on. Cancel. And I just pulled up a random example. This is a foreign stock, okay? Uh, this is an Italian stock, I think. But notice that. It just uh, goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Okay, it looks like electrocardiogram. So that's not a stock that you want to be trading. So this is what electrocardiogram looks like. And as I've said time and time again, if you're looking at a stock and you hear that beep, 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 it's not a stock that you want to be trading. So you want persistency of trend, you want an obvious trend, you want to watch your scaling. Go back in and watch the last webinar, or webinar before last, where I talked a lot about scaling. Scaling is important, meaning that it has to make a significant move in one direction or go in and read everything I wrote about trend transitions, especially the second book, 10 Best, where you have an obvious transition, especially off of multi-year highs, okay? So there's a lot of little things you can look at. Also, if you watch as many webinars as you can stand, especially if you can't sleep at night, that's why I'll put you to sleep. But watch as many webinars as you can stand where somebody asks me about a stock, and I pick it apart. And I'll either like it, obviously, or I don't, and I'll go in and show you why I like it and why I don't. But you want to see persistency in trend, acceleration of trend, uh, meaning you want higher highs and higher lows, but you want to see those bars expanding as the stock price goes higher. And there's a lot of little things like that. Uh, a lot of it's in the book, and a lot of it you just you, you know you just gonna, it's just it's just going to take some some experience, you know that too. So yeah, just hang in there, John. Give yourself some time, and you'll uh, you'll get it. Hobie used to race boats. Cool. What's the optimal way to increase persistence size as trading account hopefully slowly increase? Increase persistence size doing bad trading conditions not favorable. And trading uh, conditions may not last very long, increasing persistence size. Okay. John's asking, we, had, we covered this a while back, and we covered it in a lot of details. And let me just summarize it as quickly as possible. Like, how do you increase your trading size? And the answer is slowly over time, okay? 
So let's say that's time. That's your time axis. And let's say you're going to increase to 2%, okay? So this is what it's going to look like, okay, over time. But make sure you're profitable. You know, you might only start out at a quarter percent per trade or whatever, okay? If you're risking, let's say, let's say a half a percent or a quarter percent, then slowly increase your size over time to that 2%. And this way you get good times and bad times in between, okay? A lot of people tend to pile in like right here and just go maximum position size and what happens? The market corrects and then it goes on to trend again, you know? So it just, you just have the mother of all drawdowns after that. So you want to slowly increase your position size over time and say, okay, you know what? For the next six months, I'm going to risk a half a percent per position. I don't care if the markets go up. I don't care if they go down. I don't care if they go sideways. I'm going to risk a half a percent per position. And if you're profitable after six months, then you say, you know what? I'm going to bump that up to three quarters of a percent. And if you're profitable for the next six months, then you're going to bump it up to one percent. Okay? Keep in mind that you might, it might not be you. You could have bad conditions for six to eight months in the markets, okay? Trust me, it happens. 2011 was not a good year for trend following. The market just chopped around. 2012, knock on wood, so far was a pretty good year. But let's say you traded throughout, let's say you started in 2011 and you made it through that year. By the way, you're going to be a good trader if you did because that was not an easy year. You made it through that year. You started off the year at a quarter percent at the beginning of the year. Then you were at a half a percent towards the middle of the year. And now you're at, now you're at three quarter percent or one percent or even 2%, depending on how you ramped up, well, now you're trading at a big size, and guess what? you got a big trend, and you're making a lot of money. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't. You might hit the cycle wrong and end up in a, in a bad market at your biggest size, but you want to stay at that fixed size no matter what you do. A lot of people think, oh, I can back, I can, you know, I can trade very small, and the conditions are good, I get very big, and then I get very small. In theory, Boy, that'd be fantastic if you could do that. But in reality, you can't because you, what's going to happen is you're going to end up being at your biggest size right when you hit your drawdown, and you're going to have a huge drawdown. And it's going to be impossible to recover from. And, you know, the other thing, too, I don't want to get into this too far because people will, but I've seen this happen before uh, when I advise people on the money management side. You'll see funds. You know, like let's say the fund's doing this, and then everybody piles into it. And as soon as the fund begins to drop, everybody exits. And probably the best time to get in that fund, if it's a longer-term strategy, is right here. But everybody bails out, and then they wait until it does this again. Then everybody piles in, and then, it, you know, so that's what happens a lot of times. But if you trade a consistent size, those zigs and zags will eventually work their way out, okay? Do you ever get – hey, Mike, do you ever get – to the point where you don't loosen your stop on the second loaf any further and when? Um, well, I think what he's saying is when, you, when you're on second loaf of your trade, let's find the thing. So he's saying, do you ever get to the point where you don't loosen it any further? To, you know, I guess you'd be in like super long-term trend-following mode. Um, you just kind of gradually increase it, as I've said time and time again, to where this begins to widen out, where because this distance here becomes like this distance here. No, I don't think there's ever a point where you stop trailing that stop because now let's say it starts doing this. If it starts coming in, then your stop's going to flatten out, and you're only going to trail that stop when it makes a new high again. If you look in the second half of Labans, I did a walkthrough on a trade, and you'll see that for a long period of time, the stock went sideways, and the stop also goes sideways when that happens. So, yes, you're not trailing here. This is not a time-trailing stop. Just because this market is going, is going uh, I mean, you're still in the trade, you're, not, you're trailing higher, but then if it goes sideways, you're going to go sideways with the market. This will not increase until you make a new equity high in here. Once you start making new equity highs, then this begins to trail again. But, yeah, you will always trail. I mean, let's say you're lucky and you get it. I mean, it could happen. It hasn't happened in a few years because we haven't been in a great momentum market. I mean, knock a wood, hopefully this market continues to be a great momentum market. Then maybe we can trail stops higher and be in a stock for years and years 
in years. But let's say you had a stock, you got in at 10, it goes to 20, then it goes to 30, then it goes to 40. Well, let's say two or three years from now, it's at 100. You certainly wouldn't want to have your stop way down at 20 or 30 or whatever. You would want to keep trailing that stop forever as long as the stock didn't A, stop you out, and as long as that stock keeps making new highs. So hopefully that answers the question. How far back into history do you look to see if there's a trend still in the big base six month or uh, when I do my charting, um, I'll look at on one chart I look at about a six month time window. This is what my chart would look like when I'm doing my scanning. Now on my second monitor, this is what my chart is going to look like. Let's see if I can put them both on one screen. I've got uh, on this computer where I do the TC scanning. Let's see where it is. I got to figure out where it goes. So it's hard to find things when I'm doing the seminars. Oh, here we go. I don't know where it's it's hiding from me. Hello. Well, it's in here. It's here somewhere. Let me take it off. Put it back on. See where it pops up. Well, I can't find it because of the seminar. But in the second monitor, my, my main scanning monitor is going to look like this. And my second scanning monitor is going to look like this, okay? So on the left side, I'm seeing this about six months or so. And I'm thinking, hey, you know what? That looks like a pretty good chart back here, right? Okay? I'm seeing that. Nice little base flying out of a base. And then on the right side, I'll glance over. And I'll say, what has the stock done longer term? I said, oh, look at this. It's at multi-year lows or all-time lows in here. It's based. It's rallied off of the base. I don't see a whole lot of overhead resistance. So this might be worthwhile. I think it's worthwhile on a swing trade. And hopefully, it's also worthwhile for a longer-term trade. So I look at six months, but then I look at several, at least several years to see what has happened in the past, what's possible, and if there's any overhead supply, okay? What book of yours are you referring to, Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks and Fighting Information, you just mentioned, and fairly new, just ordered the book last night from Amazon. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, Ben, once you read the Layman's Guide, you're going to, you, a lot of these concepts I'm throwing out at you, they're all in there. Um, as I said time and time again, I went through the past, I think, three or four years of emails that I'd answered uh, leading up to me writing the book, and there was about 30,000 questions that were answered, and I made sure that all 30,000 of those questions were answered in some way, shape, or form in the book, so it became like, from a selfish standpoint, it became like from a now on thing, where if somebody sent me an email, I could say, aha, see page 97 or whatever. Now, obviously, every now and then I get some, some uh, questions that are outside of the book, and maybe outside of what I even intended to cover the book, and obviously I'll answer those in these webinars in a one-on-one -on -one basis. But once you read, once you read uh, Layman's, it'll uh, it'll all make sense. And then you might want to add on those uh, ancillary patterns that are in my um, other books to that. But all you need is one pattern to be successful. So you don't need all that at once. Okay. Jeff says, as you just spoke of, can you use the same entry technique for mutual funds? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you could use it on monkey bonds. You could use it on mutual funds. You could use it on, you could use it on any tradable instrument. You could use it on ETFs. Uh, keep in mind that uh, any any diversified market like a mutual fund or an ETF, which is a conglomerate of uh, of stocks is going to be slightly more efficient than an individual stock. We're looking at this stock right here that almost doubled in price, and we've caught uh, how much of that doubling? We caught about 70% uh, of that run. I'm just I'm pulling numbers out the air. I don't know the exact numbers. I haven't done the math yet. Um, so you're not going to get a 70% move over a couple of months in a mutual fund or a bond fund or uh, even a commodity, right? Com you know, uh, well, of course you might in some of these commodities lately, but uh, in general, that market's going to be a little bit more efficient. Now, just to save on time, uh, shoot me an email, and I'll give you a paragraph or two that are written up about efficiency, and that should answer your question. 
uh, on that. I'm having trouble with trailing stops as well even after reading Laban's multiple times. As an example, I've been short IAG from 18. We're short IAG too. My current stop is at 60. Do you think it's too tight, too loose, or okay? Probably too tight. Okay, this is one we are short. Well, I don't know. That's that's not too bad. Uh, let's see. Short from 18, 16. Yeah, if it's at 60 now, it's a, your HV is 42. Um, it moves around about a point or so uh, every couple of days, just kind of eyeballing it in here. Uh, where's our stop on this one? You know, every – let's see if I can get this up. Let's see. Oh, I, I, I don't want to pull it up uh, just in case some private information comes up. Um, but, yeah, I don't have all that in front of me at the second. I have to switch gears. But you're at 16. You know, you've given it, you've given it quite a bit of wiggle room. That's pretty good. You got a nice little base up here. It shouldn't come all the way back up to that base. So I don't think you're I don't think you're too tight on that. I think you're okay. Um. So, yeah, you know, just the there's some games you can play with helping you. Uh, with the stops, um, sometimes I play a little game called Keep the Change. And Keep the Change is just saying, okay, I'm in this stock. It closes here. And I've got a nice little profit, and I'm in this longer-term trend-following mode because I got my little swing trade profit out. Let's say it was at uh, uh, 10 bucks a share. And then let's say it rallies up to 10.25. Well, I just say Keep the Change. And what I do is I'll just leave my stop where it is, okay? Now, let's say it jumps up to like 11, okay? Well, then I might pull up my stop a little bit, but not a full point, maybe like uh, three-quarters of, uh, of a point or something like that. And now my stop is here. Let's say it goes to 11 and a quarter. Well, I'm not going to split hairs in that quarter. I'll just say, you know what, keep the change. So I'll keep the profit. Uh, I'll keep the uh, stop where it is, okay? So if it's only moving a small amount, I just say keep the change. Now, if it makes a significant move, then it begin to tighten that stop further and further. But ideally, you want to just slowly tighten it so it begins to loosen up. All right. Mike is re-asking a question here. He says, I mean, do you ever, do you ever stop widening a stop? No, you don't stop widening. Well, okay, I hear what he said. Yeah, 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 yeah. Within reason. Within reason, okay? A great point, great point, and I, and I actually use the word within reason, which I know is somewhat arbitrary, but if you keep letting that stop widen out, okay, it's going to get really, really, at some point, you keep widening it, it, it might get to a point where it's a little bit too extreme, okay, so in that particular case, yeah, I might I might say, well, I think it's, I think we have enough room in this, but this takes, a, that's a good problem to have. And that takes a long time to get to. So what he's saying is, you know, we're trailing, we're trailing, we're trailing, we're trailing. But we're letting it open up the whole time we're doing this. So he's saying, is, is there any point where you stop letting it open up? And I guess when it gets really, really, really wide uh, within reason, you probably you probably are wide enough on the stop. And, and you know, you'll know it when you see it. But so, the, so, the good thing is sometimes when you got the super wide stop, you'll ride out a real serious correction. And then it'll go back to making new highs, and then you can start trailing the stop higher. Now, when you know that's another time you can play keep the change too. If it is, if you've kind of reached a point where this stop is pretty darn wide in here, you could say, well, I'm not going to widen it any further because it's 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 so darn wide. If it comes all the way down, and stops me out. Obviously, the trend has changed, and I'm really no longer a trend follower. But if it goes up a few cents or 10 cents or 15 cents or just a little bit or even a quarter, you know, eh, you can let it widen out a little bit more by doing nothing on the stop. So, yeah, Mike, at some point, yeah, you, don't, you, you, you stop widening it out because you get so far away from the market. Again, if it reversed, it would be an obvious end of the trend. But you'd be surprised, though, because like on something like Excel – which we stayed in for uh, a couple of years, we were able to even ride out the flash crash in that one, which was kind of a cool thing. you know. So, yeah, let it widen out, but at, at some point it becomes a little bit too wide and you don't want to go any further. Okay. 
But the beauty of it is, is what happens is, you know, somebody emailed me and said, well, so this one guy waits until the market corrects and then he trails and stops. And there's nothing wrong with that. So what he's saying is, let's say you get into a stock, okay, and it rallies up. What he does is he waits until that next correction and the market takes off again, and then he moves the stock from there to there, okay? That's fine, and that's kind of the same thing I'm doing. Let's say a stock rallies up, okay? And I'm kind of like, you know, I'm kind of close to the vested here, and then I begin to slowly loosen it up as it moves more and more in my favor. Well, I'm giving it enough room to where it can do that correction, and then I'm only tightening up when it begins to make those new highs in here. So in a sense, I'm kind of tightened it up from base to base. The only thing he's doing differently is he's just not trailing as aggressive as me early on. And here's the deal. If you're willing to do this here and not trail it very aggressively until it's corrected and made new highs again and then start trailing it, that's fine. You're going to catch a lot more winning trades. The only problem is when something does not turn into a winning trade, your losses are going to be greater. So in trading, there's always a trade-off. And just to kind of back, you know, kind of backed into something here, um, one of the biggest things I see that stops people from becoming winning traders, and boy, I, I got to tell you, I get thanked for this so much. I get so many emails on this. And, but you know what? It's worldwide, the, the mentality on this, and I'll, I'll get to that in one second. But it's amazing. A lot of people, because tight stops are universally preached, a lot of people think that because they use a tight stop, they're not risking that much. But you'd be surprised. A lot of times, the only thing keeping you from profitability is your stops are too tight. You loosen those stops up a little bit, and you're going to catch a lot more trends. I spoke in Italy last May, and, you know, I, I normally just kind of get up there and, and teach my methodology from a, kind of an introductory standpoint, but I was, a, I was fortunate enough to uh, have a second session where I was able to cover uh, the money management and the exact entries and the exact profit targets and everything else. And I was shocked at the number of people over there who were like, oh, your stops are too loose. I can't trade with stops that loose. Well, guess what? You're not going to capture those longer-term trends if you're not willing to give a stock room to breathe. I mean, at the opposite end of the extreme, you got the people – the mean reverse of people that say don't use stops at all. That's crazy. But what I am saying is use a wider stop in general within reason and compensate by trading fewer shares. Okay. Hi Dave. Having trouble trailing going forward, do you play the winner? Hi Max or Gail? Secondary looks good last week. We'll look at the pattern. Okay, we'll look at that when we get to it. All right. Any other questions on trading in general before we hop into the charts? And hopefully we all have these good problems. These are good problems to have. How much is the stop percentage-wise do you place on an option? Well, ah, that's a tough that's a that's a that's an impossible question to ask. Ideally if you're going to trade an option, you can use the underlying to let you know whether you should be um, in or out of it or whatever, okay? So the question is, let's say you're trading an option. The problem with an option is you might buy an option at a dollar and it might go to 50 cents overnight. So now you lost 50% of your money. Uh, but ideally, let's say you got a stock that's set up, okay, and it triggers. And instead of buying the stock, you buy the option over here, okay? Well, let's say you buy two options so we can figure it out. You buy two options here. Well, if this stock drops down and stops you out, then you want to go ahead and exit those options. Unfortunately, with options, if this happens, these options might be worth zero, okay? Or let's just say they're not worth much. If that happens, okay, uh, we'll leave them on the books. I mean, shoot, what are you going to do, sell them for you know, an eighth of a point or something like that? Leave them on the books, and if something crazy happens, stocks gets, gets bought out overnight or something, at least you've got a position there. Um, but if the stock rallies up and hits the initial profit target, they go ahead and exit one of those options and keep one on. Okay, So it, it's very tough to get the money management right with options. So make sure you're trading them at a small size. And anytime I start talking about options, it opens up a huge can of worms. Those who understand options are going to argue with me, telling me that I'm wrong. 
Those who don't understand them will not understand what I'm saying. So be careful. Yeah, I mean, if you want, if you want to say you're going to give an option 25 percent, that's fine. But it depends on what kind of option you're trading. If you're trading a deep in the money option, then 25 percent sounds like a lot of money to give up. If you're trading uh, an at the money option with a delta of 50, or an out of the money option with a you know a very low delta, then um, you know, shoot, those things could drop 50 percent overnight. So it's it's very hard. All right, good. All right. I've, I've, Thank you, Willie. Willie says I, I answered this question. Good. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead. We're getting a lot of individual stock questions, and I'll go ahead and hop into the charts. We could always uh, come back if we have to. All right, what I want to do real quick, go ahead. You could ask a, stock, a question about stock sectors, et cetera. Uh, what I like to do here is I like to start with a macro and then work my way into – the micro. Uh, I'm sorry, just the opposite. Start with the micro, work my way into the macro, and let's let's take a look at the P's first. And let's just take a look at what's happening today. Ah, a little bit of indecision today. Let's take a look at the spiders. Okay, we um, we opened a little soft, as you know, and so far we had a bit of an opening gap reversal. By the way, after a weak day like we had yesterday. I like to see a little follow-through selling on the open before the market reverses, okay? And that's a, that's a neat little pattern. Let's take a look at a five-minute chart. Let's get stupid with this. And you can see a nice little uh, opening gap or opening lap reversal uh, in here. And, you know, you can wait. That's, that's, that's not a bad thing to do is just wait for a, uh, wait for a, a big down day in the market. And then, you know, let me, let me help pay for your webinar here. Let's say you had a, and I'm not a day trader, but let's say you had a big down day in the market like this, you know, it drops percent, percent and a half, whatever the case may be. Wait to see if there's a little follow-through selling on the open, and then look to play that opening gap reversal. And this is just an S&G type of trade, you know, pick up a buck or whatever, you know, and um, I, I try not to listen to Linda Rasky too much because I'm such a fan of hers. Um, it influences my trading, but, I, you know, every now and then I'll listen to a a YouTube or something or, or a video or something, and um, I'm going to go listen to her speak here soon in uh, Atlanta. But I try not to listen to it. And I even told her that, you know, when I, when I last time when, uh, I saw her at an AAPTA meeting, it's like she influences me too much. But I like what she, she calls it a pizza party, you know. Uh, you, you do these little trades, you, you know, a little something just kind of like sits in your lap, a little day trade or something. You know, you just go out, make a little, make a little money, and you have a pizza party, right? So that's a pizza party type of trade, but that's not your bread and butter to keep with the food analogy. Bread and butter is captured with longer-term trends like we did or in, in the HIMAX, and hopefully that will continue on. But anyway, shorter term, point I'm trying to get to is we have a short-term reversal. We don't know if it's going to uh, keep on reversing, but at least we have a short-term reversal this morning. That's right towards the bottom of this range. Now, Speaking of the shorter term, we are beginning to get stuck in a sideways range. I don't want you people to think that I'm just Mr. Bull because I've been Mr. Bull for all of 2012 up until uh, now. And I'm still bullish, don't get me wrong. But I want to let you know that I live in reality, and I do see that we've gone sideways in how many days? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, about three weeks of sideways trading in here. So we definitely are consolidating. Now, here's the thing to remember. When you're in a consolidation like this, one big up day makes all the difference in the world. When was this? Monday. Monday we closed at multi-year highs. So I got pretty excited on Monday. And then the prior Monday, I think we were at multi-year highs once again. So in general, this market still looks pretty good, but we are dealing with a bit of sideways short-term flop. But again, not to beat a dead horse, but one big up day puts us back to the business of making new highs. And by the way, if all you did to determine trend was say, well, the market has to make a new high, then it's in a trend. New high, new high, new high, new high, new high, new high. Hey, guess what? It's making new highs. This market is in a trend. New high, new high, new high, new high, right? That's all you need. I mean, can it be the uh, easier, right? You know, forget about the wave count of the oscillator inverted Fourier transform MACD, etc. Is the market making new highs? Yes. Then the market is trending. Okay. But last couple of days, obviously, it has not made new highs. Not the end of the world, though. Back to chart out a little bit. 
draw your arrows, and what do you have? So far, so good, all right? Okay, so P is still a longer term uptrend, shorter term, kind of uh, slowing down a little bit. Take a look at the weekly, not bad, but again, slowing down just a tiny bit, kind of tailed a little higher, kind of came in a little bit. So you know me, I like to see it uh, go back to the business of making new highs. Uh, by the way, um, it, this is a holiday weekend, um, so we could, yeah, we could see some thin trading today, but in general, you do see uh, an uptick on a uh, pre-holiday day, but you know, you can't always bet on that, obviously. Let's take a look at the quack. Not a bad day there. Opening lap reversal. One thing I want to show you here, which is actually a slightly, or, or eh, it could be more than slightly, but uh, a bullish pattern. I have one of my patterns here setting up in the quack, uh, what I call a double top knockout. And it's not an exaggerated pattern. I mean, let me show you on the slides before we look at the actual chart. But this is in, um, this was in my first book. And it's kind of a cool little pattern. I'm, it's, it's, you know, every pattern I, I, every pattern I show you, it's always funny. I'm like, this is my favorite pattern, but it, it really is one of my favorite patterns. You get a market that rallies up, and then it makes a new high, and then it goes sideways for a few days, and then it makes a marginal new high. Okay, meaning that it doesn't like break out like that. Okay, it just kind of makes a marginal new high like this, and then you look for like a knockout bar. What happens is the the eager shorts say, aha. A double top is it, a little bitty tiny double top. They get all excited about that. And it also scares out the loss of the momentum and the fake out also scares out some nervous longs. And that's that's the whole theory behind the TKO pattern. So let's take a look at the NASDAQ and look at that. So it's sort of, you know, it's not a perfect pattern. And in this one, you know, now that I'm looking at it, I realize that this was not a perfect new high here. So it's not a textbook pattern. But it's kind of more of in the spirit of the pattern where the market went sideways a little bit and it kind of made a marginal new high. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, eh, it's, you know, it's in the spirit of the pattern at least. And then notice we had that bit of a knockout move yesterday. So it's going to kind of look like a square top and then a bit of a sell-off. That's what it's going to look like. So if you take out, uh, you know, yesterday's high, ideally if you take out the top, the bottom of the low or the top of the gap, that would be a buy signal if you're following this on a somewhat mechanical type of basis. So 3,100 would be in a buy in the NASDAQ. And the beauty of it is, again, the shorts say, ah, this is, this is the end of that wave we've been waiting for, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they, they pile on, and when this thing turns around and squeezes them out, that market will accelerate higher. So it's going to look like a little bit of a square top and a bit of a sell-off after it. So that's what's going on in the quack. Quack has been in a, just a fantastic trend. You had a bit of a knockout move back here. Let's take a look at a two-day bar. Yeah, it's a little bit more. Oh, look at that. That's textbook, right? Yeah, take a picture of this. Um, I'll get the recording even better. This is a two-day chart. Notice you had this little knockout move here. That's just absolutely beautiful. Your buy signal would have been on this day here, okay, from that. It doesn't get more textbook than that. I will tell you this, though. Don't get too excited about the indices um, because I just showed you this pattern. And don't start looking for that pattern tomorrow because the indices rarely are going to set up in such a textbook fashion. Now, you can find this in a lot of individual stocks, so definitely look for it there. You just you can look for it in indices. You're just not going to find it that often because they tend to be a little bit more efficient than other markets, okay? The spy would be a better look at a double top knockout. Let's take a look at that, Craig. I see. Let's see what you're saying. Yeah, not exactly though. The, the I like the Nasdaq because it's a little bit more flat top um, in nature. Uh, I hear you. Oh, okay. I guess you're looking at at. Well, the thing about the Nasdaq is that the it, the trend comes in the Nasdaq like that. It does this, and then you have a knockout. I mean, this is sort of like it goes up, then it goes up, then it goes down. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. See the NASDAQ, you you're, uh, you're, see your pattern's kind of out here all by itself, whereas the P's went sideways for a little bit longer. So this jumped out at me this morning as a double top knockout. And it wasn't until I just pulled it up in the show and started picking it apart that I realized that, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't a high. That was as high as this high. And see, this is why mechanical trading isn't the greatest thing in the world. If you were trading this pattern mechanically, 
this would not be a setup. But you know what? This setup might just work because I like the way it looks. Okay. Um, so in general, indices remain in uptrends, going through a bit of a consolidation. Gold, because somebody's going to ask, it's like R-S-T-L-N-E, you know, Google, Apple, whatever the, the stocks used to be, everyone wants to know about. Uh, gold is still a major top. This is a weekly chart. I think it has the potential to go a long, long ways. We're short IAG. We talked about it a minute ago. Let's take a look at it. That's a weekly chart on IAG. And that's kind of like the mother of all tops. If you look at this, you've got an inverted. And it's a little bit wide and loose. Now, I, I just preached earlier about how important it is to trade stocks that are, um, that are clean. But in commodities, you're not always going to get a clean stock. But you can see that's the mother of all tops there. I think this stock has a, uh, I, we'll see $2 in this stock, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. Don't know that for a fact, but it's on its way. All right. Let's look at a couple of sectors in here. Let's take a look at the Rusty first. Rusty, bit of a disappointment, uh, I must say. Longer term, still in a trend, but somewhat in the media term, it's pretty much sideways in here. But here's the deal. It was at multi-year highs here, which, by the way, is not far from all-time highs. So in general, it's still an uptrend. Shorter term, though, guys, it's kind of uh, sideways in here. It's got to be a little bit concerned. But as long as the P's remain in an uptrend, as long as the NASDAQ remains in an uptrend, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to obsess too much over the Rusty, okay? <coughs> the NDX did your top just right. Let's take a look at that. All right, maybe so. NDX. Yes, yes, beautiful, beautiful, Carol. Good eye, good eye, good eye. Yeah, Carol's one of my... Uh, or I should say she's been around for a while. She knows her stuff. But, yeah, that, that's a pretty good look in there. Uh, your knockout move is not quite as extreme as it is. I think the knockout's a little bit bigger than NASDAQ, and that's what caught my eye. But, absolutely, you know, it did kind of that little flat top, like you're saying. Dave, you mentioned the spirit of the pattern before you called it designer's intent. Oh, I never did call it designer's intent, but I'm going to use that, designer's intent. Huh, that's pretty good, Alan. Thank you. Uh, in textbook fashion versus perfect patterns. And what do you say is the most important thing in technical analysis? You mentioned spirit of the pattern before you called it designer's intent in textbook fashion versus perfect patterns. And what do you say is the most important thing in technical analysis? Well, you know, sometimes you get a textbook pattern and it works beautifully. It, it's just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. It's like butter. It's kind of like that NASDAQ we just looked at a second ago. And, you know, obviously that's going to be my favorite pattern when, when it's just a, a like butter, a beautiful setup, perfect, perfect, perfect TKO um, type of setup. You know, I was doing an article on persistent pullbacks, and, um, and the NASDAQ setup is a persistent pullback. And I always look, when I do an article, or a webinar for that matter, I always like to use live examples so a year from now or two years from now or hopefully 10 years from now, as I said earlier, somebody will come up to me and say, hey, wow, that stock, you mentioned that stock 10 years ago, and I'll say, yes, I did. So the NASDAQ setup is a textbook TKO. Uh, I guess the point is a, a designer's intent versus a textbook one, it, it, they're both very much tradable. You're just not going to get the textbook as often as you're going to get designer's intent, okay, or in the spirit of the pattern. So you're, you'd be forced to trade in the spirit of the pattern a lot of times and not have the textbook. Now, I guess as a third, a third way of classifying it, you could say to the letter. It had to the letter means step one, it did this, step two, it did this, step three, it did this, look, this is what your book says, and then I'll say, but you know what? I don't like the pattern. I don't like it because A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, whatever. The knockout bar wasn't big enough. Or this, I didn't like this. Or it's not really trending or it's kind of wide and loose. And that's another reason why you can't quantify all this. And it does take a good eye for anything less than a textbook type of setup. Okay? So if you set your scans to pick out certain patterns, they're either going to be too liberal or they're going to be too constrictive. You're either going to get too many stocks or not enough if you try to quantify everything, okay? 
Yeah, NDX, same thing as, uh, uh, as NDX 100, I think. Okay. Would you please put the bow ties on the peas? Gladly. Gladly. One of my favorite patterns. Uh -huh. Okay, there's the peas. Okay. Uh, keep in mind with the bow ties that, or any transitional pattern, you want to trade them off of major highs and off of major lows, okay? So, you know, this bow tie back here, that's a fairly major high, you know, whatever, four or five-year highs. This bow tie here off of 13-year lows, that's a very significant bow tie. This bow tie down off of, oh, I don't know, eight months to one-year lows, the highs, not so important as a bow tie coming off of major, major highs or major, major lows. Um, the bloggers seem to have picked up on bow ties, and they'll often call a bow tie up or a bow tie down. For instance, this bow tie down here, that's just coming off of multi-month highs, no big deal there. So the bigger, the longer the period, the better, okay? Uh, Jerry, do you have a question on those bow ties, or you just wanted me to plot them? Let's take a look at the weekly and see where we are. We did have a weekly down here, not off of all-time highs, but it didn't work. Every other weekly worked for about the past 30 years, and if you look at these shows... I say uh, when that weekly was down, I said, well, it's due not to work. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I jinxed it or not, but I'm glad it's going up. I'm glad it didn't work. Okay. Okay, big thing. So spirit of pattern is more important than the letter of the pattern. Yeah, spirit of the pattern or designer's intent is more important than the letter of the pattern. Uh, but ideally, you want to pick the best of the best. So if you're newer to trading, then trade textbook perfect 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 patterns if you've been around for a while then be willing to take in the spirit of the patterns but at no means do you want to say oh this is a TKO because it's 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 written here exactly like this it, it's defined like this you want to use your eye and look at the chart make sure you've got the trend it's, it's, is it accelerating or you making wide range bars in the direction of trends you know go back and reread the chapter or trend trend uh, qualifiers and make sure it, that trend is well qualified Okay, absolutely. Yeah, RCD is asking the questions like, would, it, would you say like a perfect trend? Should, should it be the, the trend persists for 20 days? And yeah, ideally, yeah, I mean, that's a persistent pullback. You want at least 20 days in that trend. But you don't always get that. And sometimes you get a combination um, thereof. For instance, let's take a look at the Hymex again. The IMAX, you had this persistent up move back here. Okay, let's clear this chart out. But it wasn't 20 days, okay? Yes, ideally you want to have, you see, the very persistent move, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 days before it pulled back. So you only got 12 days in here, but it's still a pullback, and it's still a cup and handle pattern. You know, once you get pretty good at chart reading, you're not going to say, well, it's only it's only 12 days in that persistent move, so it's not a persistent pullback. If you're new to trading, then yes, look for that 20 days I mentioned in the book. And if you're trading persistent pullbacks and it's all you're doing, yes, make sure it's 20 days in that trend. If you've been around for a while and you can recognize the cup and handles, the pullbacks, you know, all the patterns that I trade off of, and if it's kind of like a, a – not a bifurcation, but like a conglomerate of different patterns. Like here's a stock made a nice, nice base, come rallying off the base. It's a saucer in hand or a cup in a handle, whatever you want to call it. It's a pullback. You know, it's a few other things. So by all means, it's probably a bow tie too. Uh, not that, the, yeah, it's a bow tie. So um, you've got a multitude of things working here. So by all means, take the setup. But if you're newer to trading, then, then absolutely trade in more of a textbook fashion. Okay. Say acceleration exactly. You want to look for all those things, okay? All right, we're going to start looking at some individual stocks. Steve wants to take a look at GCA, and the other Steve, you're next. A lot of Steves in here today. These other Steves I know. Yeah, GCA looks pretty good. Let's see what we got. Um. It's kind of interesting in that it's, you know, we talk about these Darvis stocks, and I guess, I guess I'm going to have to develop a pattern um, based on this if this keeps happening. Uh, my only problem with the stock, which, which just doesn't fit my methodology, but it looks good, it tends to base, it tends to jump, it tends to base, it tends to jump, you know. 
Now, if it pulls back a little bit more deeply in here, I would uh, I would say, yeah, absolutely. Maybe if it pulls back to about seven and a quarter, uh, I would I'd be giving you a high five on that one. Okay. Now, longer term, it does have some issues. It's got some fluff way back here, but eh, it's probably far enough back to not to worry about it. I mean, ideally. You don't want it to have any bad memories, but you'd be surprised how long people will hold on to stocks. And you'd be surprised. People will sell stocks at the absolute worst time. As somebody once said, people never sell stocks on the way down. They sell them on the way up. <laughs> you know, it's stupid. But um, so it will have some bad memories left to it. All right. Uh, I said the other Steve, uh, GCA. Did we just look at that one? All right. Other Steve wants to look at ICUI. ICUI. Uh, looks good. Uh, oh, wow. Super thin, though, buddy. Yeah, look at that. It's only trading 70,000 shares a day. Very, very, uh, on average, very, very dangerous stock. Um, the HV is a little bit on the low side. It's also a bit of a choppy stock. It kind of chops around quite a bit. Uh, I agree it has traded it more It has traded it more recent times. But, yeah, be careful with that one. Way thin. But, yeah, on a pullback, I mean, you know, if you want to, if you have the guts to go in and trade a thin stock, then knock yourself out. But, you know, it's advantage of being a small trader. You can come in, uh, assuming you're a small trader, you can come in and trade some of these thinner stocks. Just very dangerous. MDSC. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go out there and be a guy that's going to recommend stocks that people can't actually trade and then, and then brag about, oh, I made a 400% return. Look at these stocks. Well, yeah, you you know, could you have really gotten in the stock? Could you trade the stock? I'd much rather recommend something that's a little bit more liquid to say, well, you had ample time to get in. You couldn't have got it in. You know, it's not like some little, I mean, I see these penny stock things. Oh, you make a 1,000%. What, you know, could you really have gotten in that stock? I doubt it. Uh, CLNE for Don. CLNE. This is a different Don. This is not Don for Don. Um, yeah, this is one that's been on my list for a while. Problem is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's 11 days in the pullback. It's also pulled back to its prior pullback. So, this one will probably come off my list. Um, I hear you, though. It's still in an uptrend, although it's pulled back deeply. But it's uh, a little bit too many days. And, you know, energy stocks aren't doing too well. I don't know how this fits in with the energy stocks versus, like, a, like an oil-type energy stock. But uh, it'll probably come off my list today. Nike, I'm probably not going to like. It's, it's a big, thick stock. Um, it's okay. Here's the problem with Nike. Uh, it only it's it's HV is 14, so it's like uh, you know you, wow look at this look at this trend from from here to here you know well that's only five points on a hundred dollar stock that's not a whole lot of trend uh, and the other thing is even though it's a non volatile stock something bad can still happen uh, to you in the stock so. I prefer to trade more volatile stocks that can make a bigger move over time. I hear you, though. It has traded nicely. It did make the little TKO type of move here. You know, it is kind of almost textbook in nature, and it is headed higher. So I like the way you think. You just uh, – the stock is just too it's, – it's too thin and the um, – too thick, I'm sorry, and the volatility is too low. BV long here for Ed. All right, Ed, let's take a look at BV. You know a – Vodka or something? Uh, whiskey? Uh, it looks like it might be a little bit, excuse me, it might be a little bit on the thin side. No, it's got some volume. All right. Um, it doesn't jump out at me, but I hear you. It rallied up and it came in. Uh, not a huge rally for an IPO. I'm going to give that one a not bad. I'm going to give it a possible, okay? Yeah, let's that's possible because it did have a pretty serious rally and it is in its first significant pullback. So, yeah, I think that I think that one definitely is a possibility, all right? Okay, GTIV for the other Steve. I guess the other Steve becomes the other Steve after I do the other Steves. Uh, the problem with GTIV is uh, where is it now? 822. Where was it uh, a month ago? 822. So yeah, that's nothing there for me. Um, and eh, it doesn't have any bad memories until it doubles, so that's no problem. But 
it would have to break out like that of that range and then pull back for me to get excited about that. All right, MDSC. We'll get the Steves out the way. MDSC does not come up. You have a bad ticker symbol on that one, Steve. All right, Hobie says got a whole list of stocks. Too bitty. Yeah, just do one stock at a time so I can keep up with it. Uh, I get mixed up. Uh, LCC, LCC obviously rallied here, but then it came right back in. And there, there's a test of it. Let's say you did want to trade this. There's a testament for waiting for an entry. Let's say you would trade this pullback and you use a fairly liberal entry. Notice that it didn't trigger and it came right back in. Uh, it's going sideways for now, so that would not be a setup. And that's who you say they are not good plays. Okay, learning correctly. R G R. Ruger, a little bit better. Uh, this is a little bit on the thin side. This stock has been in my momentum list for a long, long time. Um, but, yeah, nice little uh, thrust higher, uh, maybe on a pullback in here. Uh, it could work, absolutely. Uh, SWHC, SWHC. That, yeah, we talked about that one, okay. ALLT, uh, Hobie, come back to me on the ones I missed I, I, because I can't keep up with them all. ALLT, -L -L and I don't want to repeat them. Yeah, that looks pretty good. A um, little bit of a gap down, but it's not something, you know, the only thing I don't like, I don't like the way it broke out and then just kind of drifted higher in here. So for me to trade this stock, it would have to break out higher and then pull back, okay? But usually you want to see acceleration of trade. You see this slow trading here. You want to see this over here, and then you want to see this big up day to the right, okay? You want to see an acceleration of trend and not a deceleration of trend, okay? Yeah, Michael, Michael came up with something pretty, uh, pretty astute. Astute, is that a word? I'm not sure that's the right, right word. I had a client once, and every night in, my cage would slip out, and he's a word is not a word. And I'd say, is that a word? And he would say, and he was a southerner, so he was pretty cool. Not that people from the north can't be cool, but he's like, it is now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the question is, I'm no longer using the 1020 indicator. Well, first of all, I changed computers, um, and it's no longer on the screen. But right now, we're in a market where... Uh, it's not quite as relevant. The 1020 indicator is I wanted to see a stock move 10 points over 20 days. And uh, it's a really good way to find stocks that are in persistent trends. But you got to realize that since we've had such a tremendous or massive bear market in 2007, a lot of stocks are now lower priced. So that's one reason I hadn't gotten around to putting it back on my screen. And um, I'm more interested uh, in percent moves now than point moves. Um, when I was a swing trader, I was more interested or a pure, more a little bit more pure. So I've always been willing to stay with a trade as long as it moves in my favor. But at some point, I guess 10 years ago or so, I was really a little bit more of a pure swing trader. And now I'm, I guess, I'm really a long-term trader, or I like to see myself as a long-term trader with better entries in money management. Okay, and that's the goal of uh, my whole methodology. Um. But yeah, I'm, I'm no longer the 1020 indicator is is a uh, I would sort stocks by how many points they move over uh, 20 days, and and that was a uh, 10 points for a uh, persistent pullback. But yeah, I'm really I'm not using that too much anymore. I used to keep that up here. Now it's not a bad thing to keep up here. Uh, you know, maybe I'll put it back in for next week to show you guys, just so in a case like this, you make sure you can scale it right. So you know. If ten, yeah, this stock's moved about six or seven points in 20 days. So we'd see that it moved six to seven points in 20 days. On a higher price stock, let's say $20, $30, $40 or higher, it is relevant because you can see how far the stock has moved over a given period of time. Okay. Tear is a long trade today for John, T E A R. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're already in it, that's fine. Uh, the pullback was a little shallow, but I hear you. I mean, it's been coming up in my scans quite a bit. It's a little thin, a little wide and loose, uh, but certainly in a trend, can't argue with that. I mean, I guess your, your big trade would have been on the last pullback, which is a little bit more deeper than this. This pullback was a little too shallow for me. Jive, Stephen, we're along, Jive. Uh, on the next pullback, absolutely. Uh, not a deep enough pullback yet, okay? 
But yeah, we're long jai from right there, I think. And I think I violated my rules a little bit and went with a little bit shallower we'll pullback on that one. But I like the setup at the time. And, you know, notice it, it you know, it, it came public, not a whole lot of fanfare, and then all of a sudden begin to take off. Play that first pullback of these IPOs. If all you ever did was that, you would do pretty damn good. I just paid for your webinar, by the way. You might want to write that down. Hymix. Okay. Going forward, do you play the winner, Hymix, or Gale announced secondary both? Who cares? You know, he said they announced a secondary offering. Who cares? What difference does it make? You know, here's the deal, and I say this over and over and over and over and over again. If you start factoring in news, there is always going to be a reason for you not to be in a trade, and you end up with analysis paralysis, and you will never make a trade, okay? And the on the flip side of that, the worst thing, the even worse, okay, you're either not going to ever make a trade because you're following the news, or the news is so damn good that you're going to take a trade that you should not have taken. So avoid all news. But Dave, what about earnings? Avoid all news. But Dave, they're going to have a secondary offering. Avoid all news. But Dave, what about this report? Avoid all news. Okay? BCOV on a pullback for Ed. BCOV. Yeah, we talked. Did we talk about that one? Oh, that's a new one. Yeah, this is uh this is this is uh beautiful. I like this is gonna be your first high five of the day. Very thin, okay? You gotta be careful with this one. This is definitely uh I think this is in several of my watch lists. Let's take a look at uh let's take a little peek in here. I know it's somewhere. This new the new T C you can't or the new, this version of T C because of the um because of the way the uh I know I've got it in one of my watch lists. The way it works is you can't get the uh, if you hit Control M, it, it does something with the browser. It, there's a conflict with Microsoft. What are trying to what are trying to say? Oh, <laughs> who are you, Yoda? What are trying to say, you? <laughs> what are you trying to say? All IPOs look the same. Shame on you, Dave. No, they don't. They look good now, though. If all you ever did was trade IPO pullbacks, you'd make a lot of money. You'd sit on your hands for a long time. You know, I was I was on uh, Doug Newberry, friend of mine. He's a market toolbox. Uh, he's got a little show he does, and every now and then he's kind enough to invite me in. And we talked about that in last Friday's show. And I think if all you ever did was trade IPO pullbacks, I think you would do really well. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you want to do it, uh, you would sit on your hands a lot because there's not always a lot of IPOs. But guess what? They don't have a lot of IPOs when market conditions are poor, are poor because no idiot in their right mind is going to take a company public when the market's not doing well. So, yeah, if you're just new to trading, you don't just specialize in one little thing and, and prove to yourself that you could do it. That's all you do, Ed? Awesome. That's freaking awesome. I mean, some, you know, it's just not, I wish I could clone myself. I guess I should hire somebody someday or something, but I'd love to hire somebody and have them run an IPO service for me where I just kind of, I would just give them the sign of the cross, you know, and, uh, you know, and run that. And I think, I think it would absolutely print money. Uh, but for six months a year, you wouldn't, you would, it wouldn't do much or even eight months a year. And uh, everybody, you know, you wouldn't have any, any clients. And then um, it, it would start doing incredibly well. You go from zero clients to 100 clients, and, uh, you know, right at the worst time. And then it would, it would go through. Uh, a flat period where there'd be nothing to do, and that everybody'd run away. So yeah, it wouldn't be. It would be a pain to run that. But maybe I can hire somebody to run it for me. MDSO for Steve. MDSO. These are the Steves I know. Problem with this one is it really didn't get too far from its prior. You know, it broke out and then it came all the way back to its prior little base. Okay, so it doesn't fit my methodology. But this might be one of those. Um, Darvis type stocks we were talking about. Nah, it's kind of all over the place. You know, and then look, it broke out like crazy here, and it's just it's just too much. Too much, too fast, and then it's just all over the place. So scratch that one. Klein is like WPRT. Let's take a look at that for Gary. PRT. Yeah, but WPRT has come back in too much, okay? Notice it made new highs here. And then now it's come all the way back in. So it's just too much. Throw a bow tie there. It's probably a bow tie down. Not that that's significant. But, 
yeah, look at that. You got a bow tie down. I mean, you know, if you didn't know anything about chart reading, if you had a bow tie down uh, from a stock making uh, major highs like that, it's probably the stock you want to be trading. Excuse me. Mountain Dew's coming up to bite me. How much pullback with Jive? Uh, how much pullback for Jive for Allen? Oh, it's going to have to pull back a lot, but it's not going to pull back. It's going to go. Uh, it's going to go straight up and double or triple from here, and then it's going to pull back. I'm talking my position or not? J I V E. If I could get it to come up, um, probably what I have drawn in here. I mean, it would have to pull back several bucks, but I don't want to jinx it because it's going to go on to make. You know, this is what's going to happen with Jive. Jive is going to run up to about thirty or so, and then when it pulls back to about twenty, let's say twenty. It's going to run up to about 33. When it pulls back to about, uh, let's say, 28, then it would be a good buy. Okay. But, yeah, I don't want it to pull back yet. No. Uh, yeah, I'll joke it aside. Uh, with this particular case, though, I think I'd like to see it. If you were going to trade it, I'll joke it aside. Let it hit new highs first and then pull back. And hopefully next week we'll talk about that. THLD for Howard. THLD. Uh, let's see. Um, the problem with this one is, and we talked about it last week, um, it it went straight up. It just it kind of made this quantum leap straight up here. I mean, it's okay, but the HV is uh, 226. It's a little bit crazy. Uh, I'll give it. I'll give it okay on that one. Um, it just, but it just would be so darn dangerous to trade it. I mean, this is a case where even I might be scared of a stock. You know. So, you know, don't bet the form on that. Thanks, charts are strong in this one, says Yoda. Charts are strong in this one. Yeah, you know, we're getting, you know, this is great. We're getting a lot of uh, people asking about stocks that are actually trending. Thoughts on agent for a John spelled without an H. <laughs> John and, it's John and Steve Day. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Um, needs a little bit deeper pullback. You know, it needs to look about like that, maybe to about 550. A uh, little bit on the thin side, uh, kind of volatile in here, but at least you made it past this overhead supply. Uh, I'm going to give you a high five on that one. High five, okay, for Agent. That was for one of the Johns, okay. A-L-L-T for another John, a John with an H. Uh, no, we covered that one, I think. Yeah, it's got a deceleration of trend, but let it break out the new highs maybe. XLS, does that qualify as a long? Does the gap disqualify it? XLF for Ed. Uh, I don't really see a gap in there, but that is, oh, XLS, sorry. XLS, I was wondering why you were looking at that. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I'm kind of a perfectionist, and if you look at my second book, there's a strategy called Reversal Gap Strategy. Uh, when a stock is hitting brand new highs and then gaps down, that catches a lot of people on the wrong side of the market. This stock could be in the early phases of being in big trouble, okay? I would not trade it because you don't really have a pattern there just yet, but it, it looks very, it does not look good. I mean, if anything, Ed, uh, look where it is now and go back three or four weeks and you can see that it hasn't made any for, uh, forward progress in over a month, okay? TLT is shortable. TLT is uh, is done. Stick a fork and TLT. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this was this was you know you got to divert a cup of handle work in here. You know it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you got a bow tie and and you know it's just a major top. Yeah, bonds are done. Rates are on the way up. Write that down. BLDR. Yeah, I like that one. I like that one a lot. I'm watching that one actually. A little bit on the thin side, a bit of a pullback. Not bad. Uh, certainly a high five. Uh, you know, who was asking about stock selection earlier? What do you have here? You got a trend, a nice trend, and then what do you have? An acceleration in trend higher? Okay. See the second book. It's still relevant. Remember, uh, accelerating momentum strategy. But this is where you add in these extra patterns. You know, first start off trading like a persistent pullback pattern with the TKO thrown in. Then maybe learn about a bow tie off of major highs and major lows. And then when you get really good and you're profitable through all this, then add in patterns like accelerating momentum strategy. Gold to buy? No. No. 
Gold is headed lower. Why would you buy gold? No. No. Gold's a major top. Gold's been a top since it made a gatekeeper top. And there's another one of the more advanced patterns. It made a gatekeeper back here. Okay? And it's been a top ever since. So no, 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 no. You don't. No, 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 no. You're not trying to catch a bottom. RP is short. RP? Uh, no. And the reason it's not a short is because it's already down here way at these old lows. There's no structure to this stock. It made a big, you know, it made a quantum leap lower, and now it's just bumping around its old lows. So, no, that's nothing there. <laughs> Dave, you must be very successful because you have such a great sense of humor. I'm not sure the two are correlated. I'm just crazy. <laughs> A little sarcastic, though. You had a little sarcasm there, maybe multiple sarcasms, in fact. What's wrong? There's nothing wrong with multiple sarcasms. <laughs> I like having multiple sarcasms. L, M, N, X. Oopsies. Ah, I just blew up TC. Look at that. <laughs> Talk amongst yourself. Uh, I guess while we're waiting for this cut back, uh, but there's a couple more stocks you guys are asking about, but uh, I want to thank everybody for... Take a time out of your busy schedule to be here. And let's get the charts back up. I hit a funny button. All right, let's see what else. Uh, multiple sargasms. How'd the show go? Ah, I had multiple sargasms doing the show. Uh, did we talk about this one? You see, it's not making, you know, this FBHS... Look where it is now. Look where it was. I wouldn't totally write it off as a stock that's not tradable. But what I would do was wait for that to make new highs and then trade the next pullback on that. Same sort of um, uh, what a common issue. LMNX. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, we did. Nope. LMNX. Um, not yet. And, and boy, I tell you, that's that's your electric cardiogram. I, I know, I know, it's trending a little bit over here, but that trend would have to persist and get it. It have to get a little cleaner in the trend, okay? It have to look like that, you know. But boy, I tell you, this has been electric cardiogramming for a long time, so it'd be very hard for me to get excited about this one. Also, uh, very thin stock here. Well, look, we're going a little long here today, so I might want to probably should wrap things up just so the recording will be manageable. I want to thank everybody for coming. Oh, I'm getting a margin call. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy um, schedule to be here. Um, I love doing these shows. As you can tell, it's a highlight of my week. Uh, to those who celebrate, by the way, have a great Easter. Uh, to those who don't, enjoy a day off from the markets. Anything unanswered, DavidDaveLandry.com. Thanks again. And, again, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.